What do most Fortune 500 executives have in common? After more than 100 episodes recorded with those very executives from companies like Disney, Amazon, Netflix, Cigna, and Google, the answer is clear. They learned lessons in leadership from the fields and courts of their high school and collegiate sports teams. Some of our guests' athletic experience earned them a place in their sports hall of fame, like Chick-fil-A chairman Dan Cathy. Some hung up their cleats after high school, like Delta Airlines CEO Ed Bastian, while others, like Condoleezza Rice, claimed they were terrible in their sport. But no matter their skill level, they have all told me that being a part of a team taught them lessons they still use as leaders today. In partnership with Maxwell Leadership, I'm your host, Don Yeager, here to give you an all-access pass to genuine, authentic, fireside chat-like conversations with today's business icons so that you can create powerful, positive change in your own organization. This is Corporate Competitor Podcast. With me for today's episode is Bamitra Simmons, President and CEO of Tampa Bay Partnership. Bamitra's journey includes working as an executive at United Way Suncoast and a lucrative career as a banking executive for Wells Fargo and BB&T. She played college basketball at Christian Brothers University and served on the advisory committee of the 2019 NCAA Women's Final Four. I'm excited to have Bamitra on the show today so she can share the lessons learned through her involvement in Super Bowl 55. Get your bonus resource ready from Corporate Competitor Podcast dot com slash 163 so that you can take notes on her wisdom confidence brings competence that is the one thing that if i could give to women i would sprinkle it out like pixie dust believing in yourself and believing in your skills is one of the single most important gifts you can give and also helps with your ability to be successful i don't care who you are what you do the world will knock you down you need that foundation My parents raised us to believe that we were smart and pretty and funny, but not the smartest, the prettiest, and the funniest. That confidence is the difference maker. Bamitra, thanks for joining us. Don, thank you so much for having me. I'm Red Bull excited to be here today. (laughs) Red Bull excited. That's not one I've heard previously. (laughs) You know, you have a great quote about the need for everyone to have a coachable spirit in order to be successful. Mm -hmm. You point out that just about everyone, whether it's professional athlete, a politician or CEO, they have a coach. Someone's coaching them. Give us advice on how we can find a coach that can help get us to our very best. There's always room for improvement. Look at the greats, whomever you think the greats are, a great coach, a great CEO, a great teacher. They're always trying to tweak and get better. It's something I think that professional athletes are very good at. You think about they've been playing that sport since they were a child, and yet they go to training camp and they listen to their shooting coaches. And we need to be the same way within our business careers. The way that you do that, basically on an annual basis, an honest assessment with yourself about what am I doing really, really well? And let's do more of that. But where are my growth opportunities? And then who do I know that does that really well? What can I learn from them? And I have an accountability partner that I do this with. We sit down and look at our lives broken out into categories. How are we doing professionally with our professional careers and the path that we're taking there? How are we doing personally, whether that's, you know, in your marriage or as a sibling or a cousin or personal relationships? How are you doing spiritually? How are you doing financially? It's like, okay, I'm killing it at work, but I still can't put the junk food down then I've got to go get somebody who's a clean eater that I can share my eating log with, breaking it into categories. It's also a way that you give yourself some grace because there are some areas that you're doing great in and you want to do more of that. And there's some areas where you're just maybe coming up a little short. So that's the way I look at it is breaking it down into about four or five big categories. Love this idea. Go find a coach or you have an accountability partner, whatever it is, someone that helps you see yourself or ask questions or draws things out of you. But then How do you remain coachable? If you want to have a coachable spirit, Mm -hmm. for some of us, we start getting pretty good 
we become less and less coachable. <laughs> right. We can pat ourselves on the back. <laughs> That's right. Sometimes you can even pull a muscle doing that if you if you pat hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an athlete at heart, so I'm always trying to get better and to be the best. True athletes, true competitors are actually not trying to beat someone else. They're actually just trying to be the best that they can be. And the byproduct is that you beat other people or you win something against someone else or something else. I listen to a lot of podcasts. <laughs> I read a lot of books. I've become an avid cyclist since the pandemic has started, which allows me to listen to podcasts while I'm riding. I just listened to one a few weeks ago and it had Mike Tomlin, mm. the coach of the Steelers, one of the few coaches who's never had a losing record. I think he's had a couple of years where he finished 500. He had this great quote on there that says he doesn't swim in comfort. <laughs> That's how he keeps his edge. He's like, comfort is for my wife and children. And he's like, I don't look at my accolades. I don't read my own press clippings. Listening to other successful people, their narrative, how they're doing things, the way that they bring discipline to their life helps me keep my edge and helps me keep that hunger and competitiveness. Yeah. You know, for many years, you played basketball first at Muscoota High School. Muscoota. <laughs> Go Indians. <laughs> in Illinois. And then you went to Christian Brothers University in Memphis. Mm hmm. You're no stranger to competition. We're talking here about what it means to drive that out of yourself. Can you tell us about your need to be competitive in life and how finding sports helped fuel that? Full disclosure, I am a competitive beast. It is probably a character flaw. I really don't know how to do things and not try to do them exceptionally. A few years ago, my wife said something to me that changed my whole outlook on leading people. She said, why do you think everyone's trying to do their job to the best of their ability? And I thought, why do something if you're not trying to do it <laughs> to the best of your ability? And that's one of the things I like about sports. I grew up in a generation where we all played two or three sports and basketball is and will always remain my love. Now I do all my smack talking on the golf course. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, whether it's basketball or concert choir, it requires not only for you to do your best, but for you to get the best out of your teammates. Business is the exact same way. You cannot be successful if you do your part well, but no one else on your team at your job does their job well. Good leaders and winners know how to pull that out and figure out how other people are motivated so you can give that to them so you can get the best out of them. I have monthly one-on-one -on -one conversations with all of my direct reports. At least once a year, there's no other topic other than them, what's going on in their lives, what's important to them. And I use those conversations to essentially get a good understanding of how they're motivated. Is this person motivated by public recognition? Is this person motivated by money? Is this person motivated by time off? Once you understand that about someone, you can get the best out of that because what you don't want to do is take an extreme introvert who never wants to be publicly recognized and motivate them in the way that you want to be recognized. And then they're mortified. Everybody's not going to be a 20 and 10 person to use a basketball analogy. It's going to give you 20 points and 10 rebounds. You don't need that. You need people who are going to give you 10 points and seven rebounds. You need some people who are going to be amazing practice players to get the first string ready and then maybe come in and give the, your star player a three minutes of relief in the game. The beauty of it is you need all of those people to do their job and buy into it. 100% to be successful. And then you as a leader have to sincerely believe that the relief guy on the practice squad is just as important as your 20 and 10 person, because if you don't believe it, there's no way your team's going to believe it. I love that idea about having those one-on-ones and trying to make sure you understand how they're motivated and then motivate them in the way that actually works best for them. A few years ago, I went through an exercise, you know, they have the five love languages. Well, they have a version of that for work, five different ways that people are motivated at work. So I had everybody on my team go through it, 15 people. And I was sure I knew everybody. I was wrong on half. Wow. So there's a really great point there that you have to invest time. You have to create energy, whatever it is to find that motivation tool and then give it to them like they need it. That's exactly right. You know, you have a twin sister. Demetra. I was born in the 70s where all twins had to have rhyming names. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And I know you're close to her. 100%. Tell me about the other side. Tell me about the competition of having a twin sister. 
having a twin was in many ways a wonderful way to grow up. We are military kids. So my father was active duty in the Air Force and as a retired colonel. So we moved about every two and a half years. We went to three different high schools. It was always nice to have somebody that you could eat lunch with. And it's one of the things, Don, that makes me effective at the role I have now in bringing the region together is because I have the ability to connect with people very quickly. Military people say you have two favorite places, where you used to live and where you're going to go. Because you know, hey, we're probably only going to be here for two years, you learn to jump in fairly quickly. I can't give myself a year (laughs) to get going and meet friends and get involved because by the time I do that, we're going to be on to the next place. You didn't go in the first day of school by yourself because you had your twin with you, even if we were not in the same classes. There are very few things in life that you do by yourself. You go through every grade and you're taking classes at the same time and you're learning to drive, you know, at the same time and you're graduating from college at the same time. So there is innate competition within twins in any shape, form or fashion. But for Demetra and I, we really use it as a motivational tool. And then once we got to be in seventh grade, we kind of found our own lane. I was in the band. She was in the choir. I played basketball. She played volleyball. So we weren't taking minutes from each other on the same team. I like to think it's because she was not playing as well as I was. So (laughs) she decided to find a different lane. (laughs) I'm sure that little trash talk won't find its way into a Thanksgiving dinner. For sure. For sure. I love it. You know, I love the quote you had about your parents. You talked about hitting the parent lottery. Every parent would love to hear that. How did your parents help you become a leader? They always told us we were leaders. Even when we were kids, they would say, you don't follow people, people follow you. Okay, I'm seven. Sure. (laughs) You know, I joke, but I'm not joking. You know, they raised us to believe that we were smart and pretty and funny, but not the smartest, the prettiest and the funniest. Mm -hmm. That's a nuance. And then church, you're at church, post Sunday school program, you're in second grade, you know, and they have you get up and say, you know, hey, we raised seven dollars and 24 cents and offering in my Sunday school class. But everybody's cheering for you and smiling back at you. And that builds your confidence. You're up in front of people. You kind of can't do it wrong. They're all loving on you. All of those things combined together brings a lot of inherent confidence because I don't care who you are, what you do. The world will at some point knock you down. Mm. You need that foundation. My parents were great at it. I mean, I remember being in fourth grade. Oh, I made the highest score on whatever it was. My dad was like, okay, but those kids are not your competition. What? Your competition is every fourth grader around the world. Do you think you have the best score out of them? They helped me to start thinking that like, I'm not competing against these people that I'm sitting next to. I'm working to be my best. You got to compete with all those other fourth graders. Now, <laughs> right. now I'm super intimidated. <laughs> <laughs> you know. You have a deep passion for the idea that girls and women getting involved in sports plays a role in their ability and their success later in life as they climb executive ladders. In your mind, what's the connection between competing in sports and business leadership? Confidence brings competence. (laughs) Oh, I like that. There are all these statistics, Don, that talk about women and girls being in competitive sports, they're less likely to be pregnant out of wedlock. They're less likely to try hard drugs. They're less likely to be in an abusive relationship. So it has a lot of positive life connotations to that. And I think it translates to one thing, and that's self-confidence. That is the one thing that if I could give to women, even my age that are in business, I would sprinkle it out like pixie dust because believing in yourself and believing in your skills is one of the single most important gifts you can give and also helps with your ability to be successful. Sports allows you to do that because you learn not to get too high or to get too low. There are days that I played in a game and I stole the ball from someone at half court and we won. And there were other games the ball got stolen from me at half court and we lost. You just learn not to get too high or too low and also to ignore all the external noise. That is like the beauty of translating your sports. And it's not arrogance. It's just, hey, I practice. I run the plays. Business is the same way. Like I've prepared for this prospect call. I've anticipated what I think the objections may be. I'm ready to go. That confidence is the difference maker. So you talk about ignoring the external noise. 
Mm-hmm. Almost no great champion or no great athlete or winner I've ever been around doesn't have a little chip on their shoulder. Yes. Something that was said about them, some coach or some teacher or some adult who told them you have no chance. And then in some way, that external noise plays its role in giving them fuel. Right. Is there a chip on your shoulder? Yeah, of course. Uh, I remember the principal's name. We were living in Italy or Sicily. We were in junior high school. The assistant principal at the school didn't let us into the National Honor Society. We met all of the criteria and he just didn't let us in. I remember my parents went to the school to try to get some understanding. And he said in the meeting, your kids are, you know, exceptional athletes, they're exceptional students, and they may never be told no in their lives. And this is going to be the one time that somebody tells them no. And I thought, why is that a lesson that someone needs to learn if they fit fit the criteria? So it reminded me, like, the part that you can control is you. Put yourself at all times in the best possible shape so that nobody can do you the dirt. (laughs) You know, as they would say, bulletin board, locker room material. So whenever I get some type of someone pushing back, I'm back in seventh grade in that assistant principal's (laughs) office. So, yes, of course. (laughs) You know what? Thank you for sharing that with us. A lot of us have those moments when you go, gosh, am I wrong to be hanging on to this? little newspaper clipping or whatever it is. Uh, If you've ever listened to or watched the uh, Michael Jordan Hall of Fame speech, that whole thing was just a grievance speech. And you in seventh grade, you did this. And George Gervin, I'm like, didn't you win, man? (laughs) I know. He invites to his Hall of Fame speech the guy that beats him out for the team as a sophomore in high school. Crazy. You know, you speak often about how sports pulls communities together as well. Mm -hmm. It's big in Tampa Bay, your community there. Yeah. How does sports break down barriers in a community that otherwise divide people? We've seen it over the years, even when there's a tragedy in a community. I think about New Orleans with the Saints right after Katrina and the Saints brought the whole community back together. We've seen it in Boston after the marathon tragedy and the Red Sox bringing the whole community back together. Something that we can all rally around, something that we can get on a unified accord to cheer for. When you get into sports, That's not about people being black or white or tall or short or male or female. It's just athletes. Everybody wants to see themselves in some way a gladiator in their own life. Sports reminds us that we have more in common than we have in differences. Tampa Bay is no different. We had a run where our baseball team had gone to the World Series. Our hockey team had won the Stanley Cup and the Bucks won. The Super Bowl. And then all of a sudden we were like, we're Tampa Bay. Champions live here. The Tampa Bay region. Don, people felt as strongly about that that lived in the city of Tampa as they did that lived in Manatee or Bradenton because the sports teams belong to all of us. You're right. For those several hours, you could be sitting next to a neurophysicist on one side and an oil changing attendant on the other. And (laughs) For three hours, you've got that all in common. None of the rest of it matters. Whatever that team shirt we have on, we're doing that right now. (laughs) We're doing that. So through your work in the Tampa Bay area, two major athletic accomplishments, the Women's Final Four and Super Bowl 55, Mm -hmm. you learned a lot about your own community. I did. By being involved with these sporting organizations. I really just want to give a nice nod and shout out to Rob Higgins and the Tampa Sports Commission, because they're the group that brings these events to our community. What we did with Business Connect, which was the program that I chaired on behalf of Super Bowl 55, was an opportunity to basically amplify and uplift local diverse owned businesses. Mm. As you know, the Super Bowl is a huge economic engine, but if you don't do it in a thoughtful way, you can look up and none of your local businesses are necessarily benefiting from that economic engine. You could look up and just have all national companies and all large companies that are playing a role. But we took it a step further and the Sports Commission now uses that list to inform and look at other things that they're doing for Sports Commission events, whether it be a caterer or a transportation company. Most all of those businesses, Don, were great businesses that needed exposure. They needed an opportunity to swing They needed a chance. That is something that is a lasting legacy, not only for those businesses, but for our community. That's something really incredibly special and to be proud of. We call it Forever 55. 
So for those of us who live in a town that's not going to get a Super Bowl, what kind of lesson can you take from what you did experience there that might help drive those same kinds of business owners together to create some local energy for themselves? Anybody can do that in their respective communities. I think it's a combination of having a chance to participate with the Super Bowl and then my natural inclination from having spent so many years banking family-owned businesses that I think about the local economy first. You're right. Every community is not going to have the honor of hosting a Super Bowl, but every community and every just about every business leader has their own span of control. You're holding events at your organization that you may need a caterer for or an event planner or transportation. Are we casting a wide enough net to our local companies? Before I came on board, we'd have things with our investors. That's what we call our members. And it might be held at the private room at Capitol Grill. And I said, why are we not holding that at a local restaurant and stimulating the local business owner? We've got some great steakhouses owned by local business. Those are small things that you can do that helps those businesses in their respective communities. I like it. So we love to talk about teams on this podcast. I have argued for many years, it's the most overused word in corporate America. Everybody talks about my team. Mm -hmm. The truth is most of them are not really teams. They're just a bunch of individuals, same business card. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering as a leader, you've been on teams, you lead teams, you've been around plenty. What could you offer our listeners as a guide to help them take a group of individuals and help form them into something, doing something special? You're absolutely right. Just putting people together and saying we are a team is not what makes a team whatsoever. You have to spend time together to form into a team. After you spend that time together, you can build trust. And then once you build trust, you can start working toward unified goals. Right. Everyone was a star at their high school. There was no one on a college team that they were not some type of high school star. You're coming from all different places across the country. People don't have the same goals. Some people want to go on to play professionally. Other people are like, I'm just here to play my sport for the best I can for the next four years. There are other folks who are like, I'm using sports as an opportunity to get a free education. Mm. (laughs) So you have all of these different things. Right. And business is the same way. You get assigned to a team or you get transferred or you, you get a new coach. And all of a sudden, people are not moving as a unit. They're thinking about their individual selves. You have to spend time together, build trust. Then you show them how their position is key to the unit being successful. I just recently listened to a podcast with Don Staley, a coach of uh, University of South Carolina's women. And she talked about getting the parents on board Mm -hmm. and saying, hey, well, we need Bimitra to be a role player. So when she calls home, She's complaining about not playing. I need you, you know, Mrs. Mom, Mr. Dad, (laughs) to be with me or else this isn't going to work. I think it's the same type of thing in business. (laughs) There's a multi-step process. Have to spend time together, build trust, and then work toward unified goals. Too often, we try to skip through the first two. We do. We're trying to race through the first two because we want to get to the goals. Right. That's why in corporate America, it's important that we do team building exercises where you do things together outside of come into a sales meeting and talk about what we're going to close this week. Like those are important, but that's not how you get people functioning as a unified group. That's great. And that's a good tip for us. You know, you mentioned listening to podcasts as a part of your growth. I've had a chance to listen to a couple episodes of your podcast. You're the co-host of the Corporate Homie Podcast, (laughs) where you discuss topics and tips that help minorities succeed in the corporate workplace. And as you discuss those topics over more than 100 episodes, pretty crazy. What's been your biggest takeaway that might give us all some idea about how to better compete at the corporate level? Probably the biggest thing and the reason why we even started the podcast is it didn't matter whether you were working at an architectural firm or a bank or a law firm or XYZ Fortune 500 company. There were all of these unwritten rules that you're being held to that you don't necessarily have the rules to, but you're supposed to know them. Don't be afraid to help someone who doesn't necessarily look like you have your background. Mm-hmm. I think for most people, they just have a similarity bias. 
that's just really natural to do. You're seasoned in your career and you see someone who reminds you of yourself and you want to help that person. And that's awesome. That's great. But what's equally effective is to try to help someone that doesn't necessarily look like you because they're probably the person who really needs that leg up. And it's all these subtle nuances that can make or break your career. It's been a really good, fun thing to do, especially to post it with my twin sister. And if you listen, as you have to the episodes, you know that Demetra and I have very different approaches <laughs> to, to a lot of this stuff. You know, start off just as a passion project that has morphed into a little small business now because organizations bring us in to come and speak to their various groups. But we've literally done zero marketing, <laughs> like no PR for it's total word of mouth kind of thing, which is uh, has been a lot of fun. <laughs> that is that is fun. And you guys clearly have fun while you're doing it. One of your episodes specifically talked about how to handle conflict at work. Conflict at work is real. Right. It happens everywhere. Any tips you've learned while working on that podcast that you might give us to help those of us who might have a little friction in the workplace? The biggest thing as it relates to handling conflict is to understand that all conflict is not a negative thing. There are certain things that should be a natural tension and push-pull. I'll use my background in banking. It is natural for the relationship managers want to give the largest amount of loan with the loosest amount of terms to their prospect. And then for the credit officer, they want to try to manage some of that risk and structure it a little bit tighter. That is a natural conflict. That's natural push-pull that really has served me well to really assume positive intent. Just because you heard it in a certain way or you were offended, it's always good to take a breath, reread it, maybe go get a sandwich, come back, take a quick walk before you just respond. There are times that someone has said something that has upset me. I will write my response out and put it in my draft email, then come back and look at it an hour later. I'm not as steamed. I could probably make my point without being as assertive, assuming positive intent that just because you felt it in such a way doesn't mean it was intended. I mean, there are going to be times that that's the case, but most of the time, it's really just a big misunderstanding. You can't hear tone in email. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't even have taken it that way. Had we been on a live conversation on the phone or in person? And how true that is, especially in person. We're doing less and less of that in many workplaces. We're doing things over phone calls and so much is lost in that inability to just sit across the table from each other and talk or hash things out. So you know what it's like to be a trailblazer and a role model. You were the first black and female leader with the Tampa Bay Partnership. And Coalition of Regional Business Leaders. Mm -hmm. These are milestones that I'm glad we're celebrating, but I love the way you say you're looking forward to the day when you can just be known as a CEO, period. Right. Not a Black CEO. Right. Right now, we are all taught to think and gender and race. If I were to give you a list of different occupations and just off the top of your head, I ask you to tell me what gender and race do you see, whether it's nurse, basketball player, CEO, investment banker, sanitation worker. If I say basketball player, most people are going to think black male. But Caitlin Clark is an amazing basketball player. But that's just not at top of mind. Right. We all have in our minds based on the way that our society functions of who that is. When you're living overseas, you're just Americans. You're not dissecting yourselves in the small groups. I spent a semester in Japan. I was American. I wasn't a Black American. I was just American. We live in the Northeast, what I call the Deep South. And I joke that there's the South and then there's Texas and Florida. <laughs> you know, they're they're kind of doing their own thing. When we can get away from that and you say CEO and I go, man, I don't know. That could be anybody. That is when I think that we're in the type of society that I want to live in. You want to be recognized for what you're doing in the skill and the talent that you bring, even if you're outside of what someone's initial thoughts of what that role looks like. Yeah. It sounds really Fisher Price and basic, but just get friends who don't look like you that grew up differently than you did. For 70% of the country or Americans rather, if they don't have diverse friends in elementary school, that they will never have diverse friends. Wow. We're not just talking about race or gender, like 
some of it is just social economics. Everybody is coming from the same neighborhood with the same financial means. Just saying like, hey, I'm going to make a point to get to know someone who's different than me. I'm going to have lunch with someone who is different than me. I'm going to have a cup of coffee and just challenge ourselves to do that. If you just did that once a quarter, that's four people. Mm. We're not talking about giving yourself a bunch of homework. That's what's great about programs like Leadership Florida. You bring all these different leaders together. They're from all these different backgrounds. They grew up differently. They're doing different things professionally. But then you realize like, hey, we're all like driven, motivated (laughs) people. And I believe that most people want to do things for the right reasons. We just may have different paths of how we want to get there, but they really are noble in the way that they're approaching things. But you're not going to know that if you've only surrounded yourselves by the other yous in life. The other yous. I love it. You know, I've spent a 30 year career in journalism asking great coaches, others, if they could identify one habit that they believed allowed them to separate themselves from other competitors, other people. One thing they built into their daily routine that they believe gave them an advantage. I'd love to ask that of you. Is there a habit, something you've done that you build daily into what you do that you think gives you an advantage? I wake up and I'm quiet. Mm -hmm. I don't grab my phone as soon as I wake up. I don't look at my emails or look at social media. I start the day in a quiet space, reading some type of daily devotional and a morning workout. This is early. I mean, this is in the 5.30, 6 a.m. And then I look at my emails and whatnot before I get in the shower to make sure something's not blowing up. Just starting that day being quiet and getting into my own personal space, it makes me feel like I'm setting the tone of the day instead of the day dragging me around. If you get up immediately and you look at social media or you look at your email, you feel like you're behind and you just woke up. Already, yeah. Whereas if you get up and you do whatever your thing is, get a workout in, have a cup of tea, read the paper, start your day with some quietness. I like that. That's great. That's a unique answer. Haven't got that one often. So how can our guests best connect with you? I'm BK Liggins on everything. And then, of course, LinkedIn, Demetra Simmons on LinkedIn. So, yeah, this has been fun, though. <laughs> no, thank you. And then you got to make sure we plug the Corporate Homie. Corporate Homie is on all those platforms as well. And Homie is H-O-M-I-E. Thank you for allowing me to amplify corporate home. <laughs> I love it. Mitra, thank you so much today for being a corporate competitor. Thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun, Don. A lot. <laughs> I am Red Bull ready to give you my takeaways from today's presentation. I do want to start, though, by giving a shout out to our listener, Gerardo Monroy from Charlotte, North Carolina. He sent me Just the kindest note about how he's applied lessons from our guests to his personal and professional life. But Mitra had so many great takeaways, but the first one for me came right out of the box when she talked about the importance of coachable spirit. Wherever we are, there is always the opportunity to grow and that we need annual check-ins, an annual assessment where we compare ourselves against where we believe we need to be in our professional path, our our personal life, maybe spiritually, financially, and having a good accountability partner. But assessing yourself against where you should be gives you the chance to constantly remind yourself to be coached. Go find people that can help you in your growth. The second great takeaway for me came out of that question about the chip on her shoulder. And she immediately identified an assistant principal in Italy in seventh grade that told her that she and her sister couldn't be part of the National Junior Honor Society. We all have those moments. And sometimes we think it's odd that we still hold on to them. But the truth is all great folks have them. But the key is what do you use that chip to help you accomplish? Bermitra said it helps her remember that you have to control the things you can control and be aware of those things you can't. She couldn't figure out how to control that principle, but what she could do was control the way she responded. Powerful, powerful. But then also I loved the lesson from her father. As he was building confidence in his daughters, 
He told them even as early as seven years old that they were leaders. They needed to think of themselves in that way that other people will are following you. Be aware. You're smart, you're pretty, and you're funny. But you're not the smartest, you're not the prettiest, and you're not the funniest. What a great lesson and what a reminder for me as a father to be able to do that. Forget my work. This was a great one for me today for my leadership in other aspects of my life as well. Thank you so much. I hope you gained as much today as I did. Go out and continue your growth as a corporate competitor. If you could share one habit, one thing you've done consistently that allowed you to separate yourself from your competitors, what would it be? In my 30 year career, 2,500 of the greatest athletes, coaches, and leaders answered that question for me. This is Don Yeager who did that uh, I was, that article I was telling you about. Don Dave Sims with Coach K. How you doing? Hey, Don. How you doing, my man? Great, sir. How are what you? they gave to me is what I'm giving to you in my online course, Journey to Greatness. Through engaging storytelling and on-demand videos, you will learn the 16 habits that will jumpstart your personal growth. I will instruct you on how to apply these winning characteristics to your life through custom workbook exercises. We are slashing the price for our podcast listeners. Lifetime access to Journey to Greatness is normally $399, but for our podcast listeners, it will be $49 with the code podcast at checkout. Click the banner on corporatecompetitorpodcast.com to enroll. I appreciate you.